Welcome to another episode of Beyond Risk and Back. Thank you so much for being here, moms, dads. Great to have you here. I'm looking forward to this conversation with Karen today because we're actually, when Karen and I were talking offline just a few minutes ago, it suddenly dawned on me as I was reading her bio, and I know this is going to... Um, this is going to make for an incredible conversation, but it suddenly dawned on me that here we have this trauma specialist. She's an MSW, ACSW, and LCSW. She's a trauma recovery expert. But as I'm reading her bio, suddenly I see that as a child, she ran away. And I was like, I have never done a show on running away. We've done a lot of show on trauma. I don't think you can do enough shows on trauma personally. There's so many of us who are walking wounded without healing and that needs to change. And certainly children after COVID and this lockdown experience and just children in general, trauma is massive. But it was suddenly the light bulb that says, what do we do when our children run away? What do we say after they come back? Why is this a strategy? And I truly believe We've got the boss goddess to talk to us and teach us and tell us and help us heal around these runaway children. We're going to get in with Karen Robinson, trauma recovery expert right now, but thank you for being here. You know there's parents who need to listen to this show and they're not, but you are. And that tells me what I need to know about you. So please make sure you hit that listen, like, subscribe, and share. And if you would be so kind to go to iTunes and leave me a review, that really does help parents help parents find this podcast. And that's, that's the whole point of this podcast is to help parents help parents. Let's jump into it with Karen Robinson. Karen, thank you so much for being here. I'm looking forward to this conversation a lot. Thanks for having me here, Aaron. It's really a big pleasure for me as well. We're talking about a subject. I've certainly had a lot of experience with runaways, runaways who've had the horrid nightmare experience of ending up being trafficked, runaways who had the, I'm running away, and they spend the night at a friend's house for a few nights, and, you know, the, the parents don't tell the parents, and it's just a stinky situation. It's, it's crap, actually, is what it is. But like I said, when we, were, when we were talking offline and I was scrolling your bio, and you have this section called the T, and the gossip, the T is gossip. I know this from my teen daughter. Time to share your vulnerabilities. And then you went fully transparent in your bio. I was so deeply impressed by you were just like, Bleh, here it is. Love it or leave it. You, you, you have the delete button, go or stay, you know? And I just, I admire that so much. Give us some tea. Tell us, how did you end up in being a therapist, doing all this stuff? What led to everything? Great foundational question, right? We have a reason for doing what we do for careers. And I always wanted to be in the helping profession. The reason was I lived in a dysfunctional home, domestic violence, child abuse, severe poverty. And I had a suicide attempt when I was, I think about 12 years old. I was just so miserable living, you know, in my, in my childhood home that I was desperate to escape. When the suicide attempt failed, and it was a serious attempt, I overdosed on Tylenol, which is usually lethal. So when that failed, I was miserable, but I thought, well, God mots me around, so I'm not gonna try that again. And then social services got involved and my mom left my father and we had a really stable life for five minutes. <laughs> and when she said she was gonna go back, I, I'm like, no, I cannot do that. I just can't. She's like, well, you are. And I'm like, no, I'm not. We did that battle of the wills. We had an, an explosion. And when she left to, to go see my father, I packed my bag and left. So no plan, no note, no idea where I was going, what I was going to do. I do not recommend this, teenagers listening. <laughs> no, I just knew it was almost like signing up for my death to go back. Because at one point my father did try to kill me and my mother intervened. And so it really felt I was desperate. I 
packed up my duffel bag, took my boom box, and if anybody remembers what those are, I went to a phone booth. <laughs> well, that's right up there with a boom box, so now you have to explain <laughs> what a phone booth is. <laughs> yeah, it was really funny because we had a phone in my house, so I don't know why I left and went a couple blocks and went to a pay phone. So it's just all really bizarre. So I called my best friend and I asked her, can I stay with you? Can you ask your parents? She asked her parents. They said, no, they, they couldn't do that. I called my second best friend. Her parents said, we can't get involved with a runaway. We don't want to get involved. So then I started to get scared. Like I didn't know where I was gonna go. Um, I should say too, I'm from a small town. So trafficking where I'm from is extremely rare. Um, but anyway, so I ended up calling Collect. I, Cause my, I was living in Canada at the time. So I called my aunt um, in Maine. And I said, look, I left home, I can't go back. And she, came and got me. I was supposed to go into foster care. There was no places to go. Um, then the nuns were supposed to take me. That didn't work out. Uh, my English teacher was going to take me. That didn't work out. And so then my aunt and uncle said, enough. We're going to make space for you here. We're going to be your guardians. And that was a beautiful thing for me. Did this ruin strain improve the relationship not only between you and your mom, but your your aunt and your mom? And I'm assuming this is your mom's sister. Yep. Yes. Uh, what how what happened to the family dynamic at that point? Uh, really, really rocky. Because my aunt was the one that intervened and told our family doctor that we didn't have food, that we didn't have appropriate clothes for the winter. And so when the family doctor told mom she had to leave or he was going to call social workers, it, it had the strife between my aunt and my mom to begin with. And then when we moved out, my aunt is the one that set us up, the apartment, you know. And so my aunt was really frustrated with my mother because she invested time, money, energy to get us protected and safe and taken care of. So that relationship went into the toilet and mom and I was really strained for a long time. She really tried to reconnect with me. I, I just, during the blow up, she, she, it was the first time that she became emotionally abusive. And so I, I just had this wall up with her, um, but she kept working on it to her credit. And then I, um, became involved in teaching Sunday school catechism. And she decided to do that with me during my senior year of high school. And that reconnected us. You know, this this has a lot of questions that are essentially, you know, more tea. Um, and certainly families, you know, parents who are hearing what, what you've been through, you know, parents who are wondering why their children run away. Like, it took a while for things to heal and land for you. Yeah. I'm still healing. Of course. And I'm like, you know, that that's interesting. That that's a that's a therapeutic conversation to have because I still think there is a large kind of paradigm still about this idea of healing trauma. Do do we heal trauma? Is trauma healing something that you do? You're a trauma expert. Can people heal trauma? I I certainly have this father wound that has never closed. It's never healed to the point that I just say, I, at 53 years old, I've, I've learned to live with it, but it's there. I think about a biological father who never once, not once. And the, you, the whole body shifts. I, I feel like I'm going to burst into tears. Do I need to heal? Does it ever heal? Or let's, let's jump into trauma now. You had a traumatizing childhood. How come an expert in trauma healing is still doing the work? Do we heal? Oh, it's a wonderful question. The, we do heal, but it's very complex. It's because trauma impacts every area of our life, our relationships, our intimacy, our body image, our emotional regulation, our coping skills. 
the maladaptive habits we take on because of the trauma. It impacts our communication, decision-making. I could go on for an hour on all the ways that trauma can impact us. And so the healing is multifaceted. It's not, that's why I'm an eclectic therapist. I don't just do one therapeutic modality because it depends on the person's trauma history and what they respond to. So for one person, I might do more thought work. For someone else, it's more somatic work, healing their body, you know, and their perception of their body being in their body instead of dissociating. So yes, we can heal from trauma, but it, I'm not going to sit and say it's easy. Is that it's why people, commitment. it is a commitment. Is, is that why people avoid it is because it's hard? Well, it's hard, but the reason most people avoid is because of the pain. The emotional pain can be so intense. It's why people do drugs. It's why people have sex, you know, addictively. Uh, it's why people gamble, overeat. And the truth is, if we can face that pain and sit in it and move through it, it really is short-lived. We can heal, but it, it's scary to, to face that kind of pain. I think a lot of the parents who are listening to this show are in an environment where they have not been abusing their kids and they have not been, you know, uh, 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 screaming and, and these these terrible you know, matches between mom and dad and stuff like that. But there has been suicide attempts. Maybe there's been trauma that's taken place, you know, inside the home through a divorce or a separation or a bullying issue or, or it's been taken place outside the home, right? We're dealing with environmental factors that the parents are doing their best to control inside the home, but outside the home, we have no controls. So therefore now we have our daughters been, you know, assaulted at a party. And suddenly the daughter's reaction to their experience is causing strife in the home. And then daughter, despite the dangers of the world, is using drugs. Or the son is using drugs. And then despite the consequences of drugs, there's still more and the battles keep continuing and things that can help organize a life in chaos, like school, like healthy relationships, those fall apart. And then in some explosion of emotions, the child walks out the door. Now, I can't look at your situation and say you weren't justified in walking out the door. But I think a lot of the parents listening to the show could wonder, why did my kid leave? Because I took her cell phone. Why did she run away? I, I told him he couldn't play video games anymore. Why did he run away? So, so now let's circle into to the topic at hand. Why does trauma cause people to run away? We know running away makes it worse. We know it. Why would you, you, why would that be a strategy? Why does that make sense? We have to remember that teenagers, the frontal lobe is not finished, developed. It, they're impulsive. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I have responses, but I don't ever want to suggest that being a parent of teenagers is easy. And I also don't want to suggest being a teenager is easy. Both roles are there's lots of ways we can make mistakes, both parties, both sides, right? And even though the parents didn't cause a trauma per se, in some of these cases, the parents may have their own trauma histories. You know, so there's that intergenerational trauma, there's that epigenics going on, you know, the drama. When I work with parents, I focus on making sure that their children know without a shadow of doubt um, unconditional love. You know, that no matter how they screw up, no matter what they do, you'll, you'll be there to help pick up the pieces. You know, so if you run away and decide, this isn't for me, <laughs> this is dangerous, crazy, please come back home. And what I do with my own kids is... I track them, first of all. I'm that kind of mom. I, I have it, the Verizon um, Family Smart program. So my kids can't turn off their phone. If, if they do, it still tracks them. 
they'd have to leave their phone at home not to be tracked. I was having trouble with my 13-year-old before I had this plan. And even when I first got it the first week, it was a lot of tested at boundaries where I had my husband go find her, you know, from the, the spot. And so it's so scary raising a teen. My 13-year-old my is adopted, so she has her own trauma. But so all I keep telling her, I have unconditional love for you. I am going to hunt you down and find you if you leave. Um, I No matter what your grounding is, I love you. I want you here. I care about what you have to say. I care about how you feel. You know, and let's work on this together. So I do a lot of eye-to-eye -eye conversations. How do you reach them at the point where they are packing their duffel bag or when they're packing their duffel bag or in a situation that I've experienced is heading up to a room to do an escort, a transportation, and seeing the kid's foot disappear out the window on the run. You know, the, the mom says, or the dad says, all right, that was too much. I'm a little too intense. They go upstairs, the kid's bailing out the window. How do you reach something like that when they're in flight? I mean, we're talking about flight, right? We got fight, flight, freeze, faint, fornicate, feed, all these different maladaptive survival strategies. This is flight. How do you pull someone out of flight? Can you? It's, it's very tricky. You know, because some, some parents will have teenagers bigger than them. If your teenager small, grab their ass, pull it back in the window, you know, sit on them. <laughs> but if they're, if, if they're big, you know, you have to get the police involved. You can't just let them go. One of the things I've also said to my kids, we unfortunately had a teenager murdered in our cul-de-sac. Um, she was 16, went to the same high school as my oldest daughter did. And so my children got to see firsthand um, what bad decisions can look like. You know, and, and I'm not saying the girl deserved to, to have that happen, never, ever. But had her parents and she worked together on her, pro on her perceived problems, things would have been just very different. Um, so I think lots of conversations about trafficking with kids, lots of conversations on what really happens when you run away and you're homeless. You know, what just, not like scare tactics, but real, real talk. In your mind, is there ever a time for a parent, and this is this will be a hard question, I think. And I've heard many different answers to this question that I've asked, and I've certainly heard parents talk about many different versions of their experience. So I want to hear from you to just let the kid go and let them learn. Let let them have a couple nights out in the cold. I I, I and I and I'm saying this. Because like I said, one, one of the experiences that I know of firsthand where a parent said, I can't, I can't force you here. You're bigger than me. And the kid spent three days homeless, came back and agreed to go to treatment. Right. And I've told you the other experiences I've had of kids who've run away from home, been to the mall and within 20 minutes had ended up with a trafficker. Yeah. What do you, what do you do? You're, you're, you're a mom of teens. You're a therapist. God, Karen, what do I do? Typically, I'm all for natural consequences, but in this case, I, it's too hard to sit with just because of that second example. It's, it's just too risky. The, the, the world is just way too dangerous. So you go get them. Yeah. This, this again then brings up this, this experience of now you're standing outside somebody else's house and you know your kid's inside because you can tell by their phone and their parent that, you know, Maybe this is a friend and nobody's coming to the door. There are other adults there. That is an experience that I've heard parents relate. My, my kid ran away. I couldn't even get the parents of the house my kid had run away to onto the phone or to come to the door. Isn't that illegal? Yeah, the police can intervene in that situation. Why is that hard for parents to, to call the cops on their neighbors? Why is it hard for them to call the cops on their own kid? I mean, aside from the obvious, I love my kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why, why in this moment would we struggle with that concept? Well, that's a little complicated too. If they're 
um, of a different minority, it's obvious why people would be reluctant to call the police because the child could end up seriously hurt or murdered. And then other situations, parents are frightened of detention centers, but I would rather my kid be in a detention center than dead. You know, if, if they get runaway charges and end up in detention center, that's better than being dead in my opinion. Let, let, let's bring it back to you. Did you and your aunt ever talk about the running away? Did you did you and your aunt ever sit down and she's like, I get it, and never again? Or is this something about how to have a conversation with the runaway after they come back that you learned practice through your therapeutic training? So when I lived with my aunt and uncle, they were supportive and strict. I never wanted to run away. Were they happy with them all the time? No, they were strict. I wanted a boyfriend. It's hard to answer that question because I, it's not that I wanted to be away from family. I just wanted a safe family. So my situation was just different. But if you've got a safe family and the kid's running away because they don't feel safe, what does that conversation look like? How, how, does, a, how does a parent navigate trying to convince their daughter or their son that this is actually a safe place, even when the shit hits the fan. It's, it's difficult because I think there's so many different reasons why a teen would run. You know, something isn't right. And I, I, I know I have the luxury of being a trained therapist. So I'm on my kids like white on rice. <laughs> I mean, there's times I've definitely failed for sure. But I, I think when we're raising children to have a genuine connection with us, you know, lots of one-on-one -on -one time, lots of heart-to-heart, -heart. hopefully that will prevent some of the impulsive decision-making when they're older, you know, but I mean, the whole thing is really difficult. I don't want to make it sound like I have all the answers because I really don't. I don't think therapy has ever been about giving somebody the answers. I you know, having worked with therapists for 20 years very closely in my employment, the best therapists I always saw were the ones that helped the people come to their own healthy answer. Does a parent lock their kid in if, if this running away starts to become the strategy that the kid is utilizing? Is that legal? <laughs> Does that depend on the state you live in? I, I mean, that would be, as a mother bear... I'm, like I told you, I would pull my kids back in from the window and sit on them. And I would put alarms on the windows that every time she tried to climb out, they would go off. Those exist. Had them in the facility. <laughs> they went off often. Yeah, so I'm the parent that's going to do anything and everything to keep my children as safe as possible. And still, it's still imperfect. I think one of the key things about parenting is just a lot of open and honest conversations. A lot of parents get into, it's my way or the highway, I'm the boss, these are the rules, instead of collaboration, you know? And it's a fine line, right? Because you want your, your kids need to respect you and follow your rules. But if you do it with the spirit of collaboration, it, it tends to go better. I'm sure you've dealt with parents that have come to you and said they won't listen. They won't talk. They won't lift their head up from the phone. They won't get off the computer. They won't put the video game controller down. They don't talk to me. I'm talking to them, which teens tune out. They tune the lecture out. So what, what then? What, what, what's the step for parents when the kids won't make that eye contact that you're talking about having with your kid? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a couple different things about it. One, parents remembering teenage behavior is to um, become more independent. So that's normal. The second thing is computer time, phone time that's earned, right? And so you can easily unearn it, right? I, I don't know if that eye contact per se is the most important thing because in it we're talking about power turf at that point. But I think when parents use less words is more effective than lit long litanies. And I'm also a big fan of making signs. You know, instead of saying to your child eight times, 
brush your teeth, which I know is a younger thing, not normally a teen thing, I encourage parents to make a sign that just says brush teeth. Hold it up. And then if they don't follow through, I'm, I'm really big on nonverbals. You just go and plug the TV. You know, um, sign, wait a couple of minutes. The natural consequences of things. Nonverbals is more effective with kids and teenagers. They're less likely to tune out if you if you give a directive with a please and thank you. I'm not going to repeat my my kid myself my kids eight times. They already know. Oh, and with the Verizon Smart Family Plan, I look to see if the the dishes are done, not done. Oh, let's let's turn off the Wi-Fi on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I hear it coming down the stairs the minute the Wi-Fi is off. <laughs> I don't fight with my kids. It's just not a good use of my time. What's the secret to that, to not fighting with your kids? That's such a brilliant statement. I've said to parents for 20 years, if you're in a power struggle with a teenager, and then I stop and I said, say those words out loud with me, power struggle with a teenager. I said, now put on top of this trauma, mental health issues or addiction issues. How insane is it to have a power struggle with a teenager? especially one who's dealing with being bipolar or, or has, you know, showing signs and symptoms of ADHD or borderline personality or whatever. How, and now you're going to power struggle with them. Who's the crazy one? Mm -hmm. But what is your, what's your secret? What's your input to, I don't fight with my kid. I would do it if it worked. <laughs> it doesn't work. My God, that's got to be one of the most genius things I've ever heard. Oh, if it worked, I would do it. Because you could ask any parent, did it work? No, it totally did it. How do you transition the child from a power struggle back to connection? It's a great question. It depends on how angry they are with you, right? One of the key things is not to do it in the middle of a conflict. Catch them on a good day and say, you know, by the way, when we had that rough patch, I want you to remember I want to connect with you. I want to be close with you. I want a authentic, genuine relationship with you. I give a shit about you. Karen really did master in this show for us that art of just a simple statement. How do you tell a kid who is so angry at you, is so frustrated with you, or just so done with your parenting? that you just give a shit about them. I, I love the sign part. I, I make a sign. I give a shit about you. You know what? Here's the truth. They're probably going to take a marker and write all over it. No, you don't. You hate me. Blah, blah, blah. But I think we forget that feelings are signposts to experiences, not actually the experience themselves, right? First comes, first comes prime influence, then comes experience, then comes thought, then comes feelings, then comes actions, then comes results. Your child running away is a result. And people like Karen, that's not what they deal with. And I know it sounds crazy because we go see therapists because of the results we're getting. People would put their kids into the treatment program because of the results the kids were getting. But that's not the work. When kids were in the treatment program, we didn't talk about them running away or failing school or using dope. We talked about prime influence. We talked about experiences, what their life was like, and what they think about it. What they felt about it. Well, there were two versions of that, the, the feelings they wore on their sleeves and the feelings they kept inside. It's people like Karen who go into the inside and get past those externalized feelings into the internalized ones that came from thoughts, that came from experiences, that came from prime influences. I want you to go to Karen's website. I just downloaded her hope tool. It's healthrivedream.com. Karen, I'm bringing you back up. You have a uh, you have a podcast as well. I do. What's your podcast? Heal, Thrive, Dream podcast. <laughs> Trying to be consistent. <laughs> you can get that 
podcast everywhere. You can find your podcast. You can uh, go listen to this woman. She's incredible. As always, thanks to Deepin Productions for the hard work they do on my show. Remember, parents, take care of yourselves first, your adult relationships second, and your children third. That's how you do your best work with your children. I'll see you next time.